Hello, and welcome to this enhanced podcast from Enlightening Science, the outreach wing of the Newton Project at Sussex University. We're dedicated to providing resources to help improve the understanding of Isaac Newton, his importance to both his own time and ours, his influence and his thought. I'm with Jim Bennett, Director of the Oxford Museum of the History of Science. Jim is an expert on scientific instruments from the 16th through to the 18th centuries, and today he's going to be speaking on 18th century astronomical instruments. One of the most extraordinary discoveries in 18th century astronomy, as we would see it, was when William Herschel discovered a planet. Now, this was the first planet that had ever been discovered, uh, I mean, since the dawn of written astronomy. You know, the Babylonians knew how many, they had the same number of planets as we have. And suddenly, there was this guy who discovered this planet, who was a musician who observed in his back garden with homemade telescopes. The thing was absolutely astonishing. But one of the most indicative uh, reactions to that discovery was Lalonde, the great French astronomer, one of the most uh, you know, respected astronomers of the day, who said that he'd heard about this extraordinary discovery, that a planet had been discovered, but not by an astronomer, by a musician. Now that's very interesting, because how can someone who's done what no astronomer had ever done in the whole entire history of astronomy, discover a primary planet, not be an astronomer. And it's indicative of the, of the distinction which goes, runs right through, this is the, towards the end of the 18th century, this distinction runs right through the 18th century between astronomy and the observation of the heavens. Uh, and astronomy is all about measurement. And the reason why Herschel wasn't an astronomer was that he'd been using a telescope which was just for observing the heavens. Um, you know, he observed nebulae and double stars and, 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 and planets and, and so on. But he didn't measure anything. He didn't do any fundamental measure, measurement. So telescopes are one thing. Anybody can have a telescope and they can observe the heavens and they can be a musician or whatever they are, but that absolutely doesn't make them an astronomer. Because astronomers don't go in for big telescopes, the kind of thing you discover uh, a, a planet with. The curious thing is that some astronomers had seen Uranus, this was the, 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 the planet that Herschel discovered. John Flamsteed, the first astronomer royal at the, at the beginning of the 18th century, uh, had seen Uranus. Um, and he thought it was a star, of course, because he had a small aperture telescope on a fixed instrument, on a measuring instrument, an instrument for measurement. So he writes down the position of the, the star, and then when he comes a few years later to, to, to look at it again, to check the position, it's gone. Well, of course it's gone because it was a planet, so it's somewhere else in the sky like planets do. So he says, well, that was just a mistake, crosses out the first observation. So he has these instruments, which are only for measurement, and they're kind of instruments not for making discoveries, because when he makes a discovery, it doesn't do it. It, it, it. it isn't that kind of thing. So that's, I think, a useful introduction to thinking about what astronomers are doing and how it may seem to us a little perverse that, that their telescopes, their instruments, uh, are for something quite different. At the beginning of the 18th century, John Flamsteed is using a thing called a mural arc, that's yes, to say a, 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 a great sort of protractor, if you like, mounted on a wall. And he has a telescopic sight, uh, which moves across this grid scale, this, this protractor, if you like. And it, all it does is measure angles in the heavens. It measures them particularly in the meridian, which means that he, his telescope can only point, and there's another reason why it's not good for making discoveries, it can only point due south or, or north, mostly south, of course, in, in the northern hemisphere. So, so he's pointing due south, and he's, he's measuring the altitude with the uh, scale, this divided, this protractor thing, the scale set into the wall, and he's measuring the, the, uh, what astronomers call uh, right ascension by listening to a clock. So a, a clock, an accurate clock, is an absolutely vital measuring instrument. It's, a, it's an astronomical instrument, more so than Herschel's telescope. Um, so so a, a clock, an accurate pendulum, uh, a weight-driven pendulum clock, long case clock, is an astronomical instrument for making measurements, and, and, and the passage of time is equivalent if considered in the equatorial plane, it's, it's equivalent to, to an, an angle in, in, in what astronomers would say called right ascension. So that's a model for the way 
uh, astronomical instruments are going to be in the 18th century. They get better. There are ways of dividing new techniques for dividing these scales. Either they're, in, in Flamsteed's case, they're a bit more than a quadrant, but often they're a quadrant, that's to say a scale covering 90 degrees, attached to a wall with a telescopic side. Um, the telescopes become better in that they eventually become achromatic. They use achromatic lenses, but they don't become, have larger apertures. They're not, in other words, for making discoveries. They're not for looking at nebulae or or discovering the, the, the surface of, or sorry, examining the surface of planets or the moon or anything like that, or just for making measurements. And in a way, they, they what, what, what's interesting about that is that there's, um, there's a whole development of, of uh, observatories in, in Europe in the 18th century. At the end of the 17th century, there are two official observatories, really, that I can think of, Paris and, and Greenwich. So it's only the beginning of this official practice of state-sponsored astronomy. But through the 18th century, lots more are founded, not just by states, but by churches, by provincial governments, by cities and so on, and by, by scientific societies. So a lot of, a lot of um, uh, established fixed observatories are, are created in the 18th century. And one might want to think about why that is. It's something to do with the prestige of astronomy and something to do with with governments wanting to um, represent their own stability and their own enlightened um, um, patronage of, of, of uh, science by, by founding uh, an observatory. And all of these observatories, in all these observatories, there was a similar um, practice. Uh, they all knew what they were supposed to do. They all did the, this, this measurement, these meridian observations. And the, many of them, the great majority of them, um, bought their instruments from the leading London makers because it was it, partly thanks to Greenwich and, and partly thanks to one or two other considerations. There was a sequence of uh, top flight mathematical instrument makers in, 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 uh, in London who discovered that there was this potential for an international trade in astronomical instruments. So partly because of the, the need for all of these observatories to, to practice astronomy, and partly because there was the potential, the, the resources in London to supply them all with similar instruments, there comes to be a, a recognized practice of astronomy which is international. And I think that's one of the first, astronomy is one of the first subjects where that takes place, where, there's a, where, where there are lots of uh, institutions doing the same kind of thing, even to the extent that it was becoming, it was, there was a, quite a considerable amount of redundancy in this, because they're all making the same sort of observations, and only the ones who were doing it particularly well with the best instruments were going to have their measurements uh, counted in the eventual production of star catalogues and so on, which was the ultimate goal of this practice. So, in a sense, you could say, although this is, this is commercially and politically a very productive line for various institutions to take, I mean, commercially because there were makers making money out of it, politically because um, it, 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 it was politically advantageous for, 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 for the, the, uh, the official foundation and support of such uh, institutions was an, an expression of an admirable enlightenment or something uh, along those lines. But, just, so desp but despite all that, or perhaps because of all that, it was becoming rather a sterile uh, practice in terms of natural philosophy. So when someone does something really extraordinary and original in the study of the skies, like discovering the first planet since the Babylonians, it's not done by an astronomer. This podcast has been an enlightening science production from the University of Sussex. The sound recordist was Lucy Cook. It was edited by Lucy Cook and Pete Langman. The producer was Pete Langman.